It all started with a word. One simple Italian word. Canale. Mistranslation to English gave this word the power to change a mysterious planet called Mars into a technological powerhouse with an advanced civilization. What was channels in Italian became canals in English. We were no longer alone in the universe and it seems we found a civilization that has radically transformed its entire planet. But then, Mariner 4 returned the first close-up of Mars during a flyby, and things didn't look good. Not too long after, Mariner 9 went into orbit around Mars, and things just got worse. No cities, no civilization, not even ruins anywhere on the planet. But to be sure, we had to land on Mars and sample the soil, and that's exactly what the Viking landers did in 1976. But almost 45 years later, the results of the life experiment performed is still inconclusive to some of the scientists. Detecting microbial life is very difficult, even on Earth. But it can be done if we make certain assumptions. On Earth, these assumptions are justified and with lots of precedence. However, anywhere else in the universe, maybe not so much. And this includes our sister planet Mars. But with Mars having many geological features similar to Earth, including what appear to be ancient riverbeds and wind erosion on crater walls, life in the soil was a real possibility in the late 1960s. And so, one of the primary objectives of the Viking program was born. Two Viking spacecraft landed on Mars in 1976, separated by six weeks. The spacecraft were identical, each carrying many scientific instruments to measure the atmosphere and the soil. Some of these were the meteorology experiment, seismometer, and the expert fluorescent experiment. But by far, the most important instrument on Viking was the biology experiment system. This was the instrument tasked with identifying evidence of life in the Martian soil. It's also the most expensive and complicated instrument on board. It alone cost $60 million or $300 million in 2018 dollars. As we move away from relatively large organisms like insects and look at single cell organisms like bacteria, life starts to resemble a series of chemical reactions. And it's because of these chemical reactions, certain assumptions can be made about how to detect life. The assumptions are, one, life will consume chemical resources in its surrounding, thereby decreasing those resources. Two, life will produce new chemical products and release it into its surrounding, thereby increasing the presence of those resources. All life we've ever encountered has to, at the very least, do those two things. Actual life on Earth has a higher minimum requirement, but this is the ultimate baseline. If we can't get past this step in our experiment on Mars, we have no chance of living organisms being in the Martian soil. The biology experiment system has four independent parts. They are pyrolytic release experiment, gas exchange experiment, labeled release experiment, and finally, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. The pyrolytic release experiment seeks to test if any organism in the soil uses carbon dioxide in the air to build complex organic molecules to sustain itself. Dry soil scooped by the robotic arm is placed in an incubator chamber. Radioactive carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide using carbon-14 is introduced into the chamber. A xenon light is then turned on to mimic Martian daylight. The experiment runs for five Martian days. The chamber is then heated to 120 degrees Celsius. This is done to release any unreacted carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide trapped in the soil. The air from the chamber is then flushed out into the Martian atmosphere and the sample soil is heated to 650 degrees Celsius for pyrolysis to occur in the soil. The vapor products released by pyrolysis is collected in the chamber until it's purged by a stream of helium into a vapor trap which traps heavy organic molecules like methane 
but allow carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide to pass to the radioactive detector. If carbon-14 is detected, that's evidence that a potential organism is creating organic molecules using the carbon dioxide from the air in the chamber. To make sure the conclusion is justified, another sample from the same batch of soil is first sterilized by heating it to 120 degrees Celsius for three hours. After that, it's introduced into the chamber like before. If no carbon-14 was detected, then it's good indication that the initial result from the first experiment was caused by organisms in the soil. However, if carbon-14 is also detected in the sterile sample, that would indicate that some other chemical process is taking the carbon out of the air. In the actual test done by Viking, carbon-14 was detected in both samples, although the amount detected in the sterilized sample was slightly less, but that difference was bigger than the margin of error. The conclusion from this is that the process that pulled carbon from the air was most likely of chemical and not biological origin. Next on our list of biological experiments is the gas exchange experiment. This experiment tests for gases in the incubation chamber that could have been produced by organisms after nutrition has been added to the soil. Soil is added to the incubation chamber, the air is purged, and the chamber is filled with a mixture of helium and CO2. The helium is used to increase the pressure inside the chamber without increasing the concentration of CO2. A rich nutrient solution is added below the soil sample in just the right amount to come into contact with it. Every day for the next 12 days, a sample of air in the incubation chamber is sent to the chromatograph column. This column is used to separate the gas flow based on its composition. As the gas flow comes out of the column, it's separated in time based on composition. The flow is then sent to a thermal conductivity detector, or TCD, for detection. TCD measures the thermal conductivity of the gas flow by measuring the resistance of a temperature sensitive resistor placed in the path of the gas flow. The resistance will change based on how well the compound in the gas flow can conduct heat away from the resistor. The actual result from Viking showed that the typical gases expected such as hydrogen and methane were not detected. The next experiment is the one that's still inconclusive to some scientists. This is the labeled release experiment. This experiment is designed to test metabolic activities in the soil sample moistened with a dilute solution of very simple organic compounds. If organisms exist in the soil, they might release CO2 into the atmosphere from breaking down the organic compounds provided in the solution. Starting with soil in the chamber, a nutrient solution containing radioactive carbon-14 is added to the soil. The incubation chamber is connected to the detector chamber which contains the radioactive detectors, VR2. If organisms in the soil are using the nutrients and releasing CO2, then they will in time accumulate inside the detector chamber where they will be detected. The radioactivity in the detector chamber is monitored continuously for the first seven Martian days. After that, more nutrition is added to the soil and the detector monitors the carbon-14 for another six Martian days. The experiment is repeated, but with sterilized soil. The actual results show that Viking measured a high amount of radioactive CO2 in the normal sample when the nutrition solution was added, but very little in the sterilized sample. This is an indication of possible microorganism in the soil. This is the finding that made it hard for scientists to come to the conclusion that they have not detected life on Mars. The labeled release experiment showed evidence of life. However, the pyrolytic release experiment and the gas exchange showed no such evidence. To make matters worse, the onboard gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, or GCMS, an instrument designed to detect specific molecules detected no organic molecule in the Martian soil. But writing off life on Mars is not so simple. For example, the discovery of methane on Mars by the Curiosity rover has some scientists questioning the reliability of the GCMS on Viking since it didn't detect any. The truth is we won't know for sure if Mars does not have any life, especially since we're finding life on Earth in places that's similar to certain aspects of Mars. We may have to look deeper into the ground or inside the many extinct volcanoes. The Mars 2020 mission will have its rover, Perseverance, 
collect rock and soil samples for a possible sample return mission at the end of the 2020s. Only then will we be able to answer the life on Mars question partially, whether or not life exists on the surface of Mars. And this highlights the difficulty of doing science out in deep space. We have a question about a particular planet or phenomena in space, so we create a bunch of experiments and instruments to gather data and test our hypothesis. But we can't use the mountain of experiments and instruments we have in the labs all over the globe because it all needs to fit inside a rocket and survive the violent launch. This immediately limits the amount of questions we get answered per mission. Once we get to our destination and the science starts, we may discover new questions to ask. But unfortunately, they cannot be answered with the current spacecraft we're using. So, we have to go through the entire process again. Get funds, design craft, build craft, launch craft, collect data. Rinse and repeat for potentially every new question we may have. Reusable rockets and human presence won't help much. But each time we do send a space probe into space, we collect more data, gain more knowledge, and most importantly, we become more efficient the next time around. Ask more questions and get more answers per mission. And that's what makes space exploration a long and slow journey worth doing. I'm DexDFX for Sensing the Universe.